Tonight, we want to look at the life of a prophet. And if you are reading the Word of God consistently and systematically, you may have noticed that one of the prominent prophets in the Bible is the prophet Elijah. And uh, in the New Testament, John the Baptist was supposed to have the spirit of Elijah. But he examined it very carefully. John the Baptist did not do the same kind of miracles that Elijah did. John the Baptist preached repentance. There's no doubt about that. And yet, the Bible says that he has the spirit of Elijah, even though he did not do all those things that Elijah and Elisha did. And so as I read the scriptures and look into all these prophets and their lives, God began to show that there are two types of prophets in the Old Testament, and there are four flavors of prophet. So I didn't know prophets came in flavor. And uh, I, one reason God gave them four flavor is because most of us like ice cream, it helps us to like the prophets. <laughs> God brings them in four flavors. Let's look in the Bible, in the book of First Chronicles chapter 29. First Chronicles chapter 29. And uh, we look at verse, First Chronicles chapter 29. We consider verse 29, First Chronicles 29, verse 29. It says of the life of David, who himself was a king and a prophet. It says here in verse 29, Now the acts of King David... First and last, indeed they are written in the book of Samuel, the seer, in the book of Nathan, the prophet, and in the book of God, the seer. Now, although the Bible gives, tells us that in, in the book of First Samuel, in uh, chapter 16, and in chapter 9, it tells us that in those days they call, they call a prophet, a seer, and they use the word seer and prophet uh, syn- uh, synonymously. And uh, we have always looked on those two words as the same. But yet when they classify, knowing that a prophet and a seer are normally used synonymously, we notice here that they, pur- they purposely isolate Samuel as a seer, God as a seer, and Nathan as a prophet. Question is, is that on purpose? Is there something in there? There is. And as I examined the scriptures, I found that there was a consistent use. Some prophets consistently are called a seer. Some others are called prophets. Some are called both prophets and seers. You just have to go back and examine the word. Prophets the idol, the seer, always calls him the seer. And uh, God was always called a seer. And uh, he's also known generally as a prophet, but that seems to be his particular uh, inclination. Now, the word prophet comes from the Hebrew word nabi, N A B I. And uh, that word brings forth the meaning of the root word, which is naba, which means flowing forth. To prophesy or to flow forth. And talk about something rising from within them, flowing forth. The other word, which is the word seer, is from the word choze, which is C-H-O-Z-E-H. Choze, which is a word that is normally translated in its other forms as behold or see. And so it seems that there is certain prophets who constantly see. They are always seeing. And they seem to be a a, a category by themselves. And then over in 2 Chronicles chapter 29, just the next book, 2 Chronicles chapter 29, verse 25 this time. 
Again, he records these prophets and he systematically classifies them. Second Chronicles chapter 29, verse 25. It says, Then he stationed the Levites in a house of the Lord with cymbals and string instruments and with harps, according to the commandment of David, of God the king's seer, and of Nathan the prophet. For this was the commandment of the Lord by his prophets. Notice there that God again was referred to as a chosen. And Nathan as a Nabi. So apparently there are these two categorizing of prophets. Why does God classify them that way? Now it's interesting, over in Deuteronomy chapter 13, let's look at the book of Deuteronomy chapter 13. And uh, see the statement made if a prophet should arise. It says here in Deuteronomy chapter 13, verse 1, If there arises among you a prophet, well, we understand, a Nabi, or the other word that gives you, it says, or a dreamer of dreams. So apparently, God recognizes that even though Chose and Nabi are used synonym, synonymously, that there is sometimes a differentiation, a specializing, if you want to call it that way, where some seem to concentrate on the flowing forth, and some seem to concentrate on the seeing, the beholding. So some prophets would lean towards the flowing forth kind. And some in other seeing kind. And uh, the seeing kind would be qualified by this dreamer of dreams. Doesn't mean that their favorite pastime is sleeping. Wouldn't that be an easy way to be a prophet? Eight hours sleeping, record all your dreams. <laughs> And uh, when you wake up, you're, in the morning you go to your job, to your office as a prophet, and you go and sleep. <laughs> and you wake up, this is my dream, that says the Lord. <laughs> Tell me that's an easy work. <laughs> but we realize, as uh, in this morning session, we covered how that the word dream in the Greek, uh, in Acts chapter 2, can refer to, is a different word. When it says, O men dream dreams, it's from the Greek word, enapneo zomai enapneon, which is a specialized word, that talks about being totally possessed with a, with a certain mental perception or inner perception that consumes you. And uh, it can mean that a person is asleep, but it may not necessarily mean so. Like we have found in the book of Jude, it is used in negative sense about people who daydream or who are mentally deluded by a perception, wrong perception that they receive. And so using that same sense, bringing it over into the Old Testament uh, history, we recognize that a dreamer of dreams and noting that the word dreams also is interchangeable with the word visions of the night. That is concentrating on the beholding kind of prophets. So we are able to outline clearly that some prophets are those that lean on the spoken word. And uh, they may see visions, but they, are, they major in the flowing forth, and they minor in the beholding. The other group graduate differently. They graduate with a major in the beholding, and they minor in the bringing forth. These are those with, a big, with big eyes and small mouth. This group, the Nabi, in a spiritual sense, please, are those with a big mouth and small eyes. <laughs> and uh, if you ever seen a series by CBN, a superbook cartoon, of uh, Elijah the prophet, I tell you, those fellows who draw the comics, the cartoon of Elijah on the video, on, on the superbook series, was, uh, has a sense of humor. There was this Elijah walking around with his beard, and he had these big round eyes, and it was just a little dot 
round little beady eyes. <laughs> and uh, so, I, say, I wonder how, where he got the impression of Elijah. But there are some prophets with, 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 who concentrate on the bringing forth. And you notice that these prophets, they hear from God. They hear the word of God in them and they deliver it. They may or they may not have a vision. Now, in the modern sense, if I want to look for modern comparisons, although these are not perfect modern comparisons, I would possibly classify people like Paul Cain under those uh, chose type. And uh, those with big eyes, right? We don't say anything about the mouth, right? So, then uh, those like uh, Bill Hammon, you know, Bill Hammon is this prophetic group. His is a different type. His is is a speaking forth kind. He may not receive an, an open vision like the other type, but it's a flowing forth that, that flow forth from his life. And it's a different, different categorizing of prophets. So when someone says, I'm called of God to be a prophet, now we can ask them, is it the big eyes, small mouth, or big mouth, small eyes type? Can we examine your mouth, please? <laughs> Now we can check on them. And uh, knowing these two categories, you see, Agabus, the prophet in the New Testament, the prophet, seems to lean towards this category here. Now some of them are like Samuel. Samuel uh, is the type who, you know, have both a big mouth and a big eye. <laughs> That's fantastic, you know. Can you imagine you know, big eyes and big mouth? <laughs> And uh, they're able to bring forth, and they're able to see. And so those type, they function in uh, both categories. Sometimes there are those who specialize. You, you notice some of the minor prophets. They don't have long, long words from God. And you read some of the minor prophets, you know, all they have is just this vision. Then they saw that vision, they saw this vision, and with that vision came some words, and this vision, and that vision, and that's all. And, uh, praise God. And where there's others, like the major prophets in the Old Testament. Look at Isaiah, one of the longest books ever. And, and look at Psalms, David functioning as a prophet. A lot of words, you know, coming forth, on and on. Long, 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 long books. And uh, they come out. That's why I say they have long mouth. <laughs> Once they flow forth, it just keeps coming out. Non-stop. And you could write books and books of prophecy. In fact, they burn a Zai's book and you say, no problem, let's turn the tab on again. <laughs> and it came out again. You could just flow forth in a prophecy of God. So, it's either the Nabi type or the Chose type. And even though God called you to be a prophet, it doesn't mean that immediately you move into Nabi Chose. Right? Some people don't, don't even understand the, the flow from Agathos to Dikaios to Hagios. You know, and they just want to jump straight away into the third dimension. You wouldn't be, right? You start off not as a Nabi, but as a Thambi, right? Let me small boy, right? right. Let me small boy, right? Okay. Must make sure, right? Your friend here. Right? You must start at Thambi here, right? And it's not easy to move into Chose. No, right? You must view yourself flat like Tose, right? Before you get chose, everybody wants to, you know, chose and nabi and want to go straight in the prophetic move of God. And we have to understand how to flow a step at a time. Now we see here how, how David flow into the area. David is primarily a nabi kind, with a flowing forth. And he yield his tongue and lips to God. Let's give some example here. Like uh, in the book of uh, Samuel, we look at. Second Samuel, chapter 23, verse 2. It says here, The Spirit of the Lord spoke by me, and His word was on my tongue. See, the Spirit of the Lord spoke by me, and His word was on my tongue. And He continually spoke for songs after songs, not realizing that some of those songs are fantastic prophecies. But under the unction and anointing of God, he did not have 
visions every time he writes a song. No, all he has is a flowing fall, something welling up on the inside. He was not going around with these big, round, beady eyes, you know, seeing a vision and then writing it down. No, all he did was just meditating on God, and then there comes this song. And that song, as he sung it for, became a prophetic song. And he tapped on what I call one of the seven rivers of the spirit of prophecy, which we touched on in the first morning session. The seven rivers to move into the spirit of prophecy. And so, uh, David moved into the area, and the Lord's anointing was on his tongue. He, I'm sure he saw some visions, but he didn't see as many as the other prophets. In fact, in his days, in his days, he was not well known as a prophet at all. They know him as a king. He always records David the king and his prophets God and Nathan. He never say and the prophets David Gad and Nathan. No, it says David the king and his prophets. So primarily, he was a king, a singing king. It was later on in Acts 2 that he's referred to as David the prophet. Being a prophet spoke of Jesus Christ. So it, some of you, whom God had called to be a prophet or in some sort of office, and you're wondering, God, all the prophets in the Bible go around with these big round beady eyes. <laughs> and you feel that I haven't seen any vision. You know, I don't go around seeing visions and Lord, how can it be? How can it be? Perhaps you're the Nabi type. No problem. Learn how to flow into that. For others, even before they have known much of God, it starts operating in their life. They start seeing visions after visions after visions. They don't understand the vision. They start recording it down. And uh, it just seems to move into the area of visions. They don't have much prophecies recorded out of their life. But there's a record of the life they live. Think about Elijah. He didn't live behind a book. Think about Elisha. He didn't live behind the book of Elisha. No. Yet they are powerful prophets. Their main trust was in a different category from Isaiah, from Jeremiah, from David. Different. As we have mentioned yesterday night, that the New Testament quotes the book of Psalms and the book of Isaiah the most frequently. Of all the books in the Old Testament, both Isaiah and Psalms are the most frequently quoted books. Why these two prophets function a lot in the flowing fourth tide? That was important for future generations. There are others like Daniel. The book of Daniel records primarily in the first half his life story. Then the second half of the book of Daniel, it records the visions he saw and the conversations that took place in the spirit world. That's all. He didn't have the same kind of record like Ezekiel, Jeremiah, Isaiah, who says, Thus says the Lord to this. Thus says the Lord to that. And on and on and on. One country after another they name. All kinds of things. To Babylon and to Syria, to the Chaldeans, to Israel, to all the surrounding nations. It was a different type of prophet. Jose or Nabi. Now in these prophetic uh, categories, you notice as we study the life of the prophets, you could classify the prophets into these four flavors. Four flavors means that even though some of this and some of that, they have a certain trust and impact on their generation. The flavor is different. Some chocolate, vanilla, strawberry, and durian. So we have all these flavors. And let's look in the scriptures. Before we can establish these four flavors, we need some background. Right? And for those background, we need Revelation chapter 1. Revelation chapter 1. We're talking about the spirit of prophecy, which is the spirit of God. In Revelation chapter 1. And uh, we want to consider a statement made here in the Old Testament. Revelation chapter 1. Verse 4. It says here, John, to the seven churches which are in Asia, Grace to you and peace from him who is, who was, and who is to come. And then he says, And from the seven spirits 
who are before his throne. Seven spirits. Plural. I thought there was one Holy Spirit. There is only one Holy Spirit, but he flow in a sevenfold manner. It was a sevenfold person of the Holy Spirit. What are these seven spirits? Turn over to the book of Isaiah, chapter 11. Isaiah, chapter 11. Verse 1. Isaiah 11, verse 1. We need all this background. In order to look at the four flavors. Chapter 11, verse 1 and verse 2. Then shall come forth a rod from the stem of Jesse, and a branch shall grow out of his roots. The Spirit of the Lord shall rest upon him, the Spirit of wisdom and understanding, the Spirit of counsel and might, the Spirit of knowledge and of the fear of the Lord. Notice in verse 2 that there are sevenfold spirit. One Holy Spirit, sevenfold uh, manifestation of flow. Number one, the Spirit of the Lord. Number two, the Spirit of wisdom. Number three, the Spirit of understanding. Number four, the Spirit of counsel. Number five, the Spirit of might. Number six, the Spirit of knowledge. Number seven, the Spirit of the fear of the Lord. So they, you have there the seven spirits of God that was on Jesus' life. Now, these seven spirits flow into four dimensions or four winds. Number one, you notice that the word spirit occurs four times even though there are seven descriptions of it. It says that the spirit of the Lord, that's that's the first, first time it's mentioned. Then, the second time it's mentioned, the spirit of wisdom and understanding. They lump wisdom and understanding together. And then number three, they lump counsel and might together and call it the spirit of counsel and might. And then number four, the spirit of knowledge and of the fear of the Lord. Four times the word spirit occurs. To point to us a significant thing, and they talk about spirit of prophecy. When you begin to deal with the spirit of prophecy, you will undoubtedly have to deal with the winds of God. Now, there is not only the wind of God singular, the Bible always talks about the four winds of God. And these four winds of God are represented by the north wind, the east wind, the south wind, and the west wind. And these four winds of God flow together. You will notice that these four winds are actually number one, two, three, and four, as recorded in Isaiah chapter eleven, verse two. Ezekiel in Ezekiel chapter thirty-seven. Ezekiel chapter thirty-seven. Let's look over there. We have to lay all these foundations first before we look into the four prophetic flavors. In Ezekiel chapter thirty-seven, right? We are laying a foundation. And uh, these are clear-cut, simple truths that are in the Bible that we have to look at before we analyze the prophets. Before we analyze something, we have to have the tools to analyze. And so here are the tools that we're laying out. Ezekiel chapter 37. And uh, that powerful vision that has been used over and over again to uh, speak about revival. Notice it says in verse 9, Then he said to me, Prophesy to the breath. Prophesy, son of man, and say to the breath. Thus says the Lord God, Come from the four winds, O breath, and breathe on this slain that they may live. Notice there are four winds. Come from the four winds, he says, and breathe on these bones that they may live. 
In the book of Daniel, this morning we refer to that. Notice that even in the scriptures we read, as we analyze visions and dreams and allegorical prophecies of the second degree, this morning we talk about four degrees of the spirit of prophecy. Oh, uh, so far our subjects we have touched on seven rivers of the Holy Spirit. And uh, last night we talked about three dimensions uh, of uh, the prophet's uh, office. And uh, then we also talk about the four levels of the spirit of prophecy. And uh, we talk about uh, the normal level. And uh, we talk about the giver of prophecy, ministry of prophecy, and the office of prophet. This morning we talk about the four degrees of the spirit of prophecy. And so tonight we are looking at the two types of prophet and the four flavors of prophet. Right? After you go back, you got a lot. Two, three, four, seven. Right? All these things. And you can connect it together. In the book of Daniel chapter 7 this morning, we mention about how Daniel saw this vision of the night in a dream. And he saw these four creatures that came out representing the four empires. But you notice something here. That just before all those things took place, Daniel saw the four winds moving. And every time before God moved, there is always a wind. Remember what happened in the book of Acts chapter 2. There was a sound like a rush of a mighty wind. As the wind of the Holy Spirit. There is a natural wind of course, but the natural world is a type and a picture of the true spirit world. And every time before a great move of God, there is always turbulence in the spirit world. Before nations rise and nations fall, before dramatic world events that you read about in the headlines of the papers take place, there is fantastic turbulence resulting from the working of the angels and the four winds of God. So these four winds of the Holy Spirit, which will be a part and parcel of the last move that God brings forth, are the Spirit of the Lord, the Spirit of wisdom and understanding, the Spirit of counsel and might, the Spirit of knowledge and the fear of the Lord. And what we must understand is that these four spirits in Isaiah 11 verse 2 is the same as the seven spirits. So you have seven, spir- seven spirits, seven but four. Four but seven. Right? We're beginning to talk in Proverbs. Because in the book of Proverbs, it's always say, you know, and there are three things, yet four. <laughs> There's seven things, yet five. You know, something like that. Things of the Spirit very hard to describe. And uh, so here we have these four winds of God. The Spirit of the Lord is the north wind. The Spirit of wisdom and understanding is the south wind. The spirit of counsel and mind is the east wind. The spirit of knowledge and of the fear of the Lord is the west wind. Let me tell you how it came about that. See, when I saw what God was showing me about the winds of God, and uh, if anyone has ever been in the spirit world, anyone of you ever been in the spirit world, you understand that there is a lot of spiritual wind going on. There's a lot of things going, activity going in the spirit world. And we know in the natural that winds are caused by the movement of air due to temperature differences and air pressure differences. But in the spiritual, what is causing the wind? It's the moving of the Holy Spirit. And there's four winds as he began to work out God's plan on this planet Earth. When I saw how important the winds of God were in relation to revival, I did a deep and thorough research. Every time when the word north comes in, I read every verse. Everywhere where the word east comes in, I read every verse. And analyze it. Everywhere where the word south comes in. You see, if there's a Bible truth, it must be consistent from Genesis to Revelation. Truth must always be consistent in any scripture you turn to. And so one of the things I began to saw rising up from the scriptures as I analyzed it and studied it is this. 
that always when God talks about different types of wind, there is a double reference. That means there is a natural reference and a spiritual reference. There was an actual physical wind, but there was an allegory that points to the spiritual realm. And we will start with the east wind. Because God always starts with the east wind. When He built the tabernacle of Moses, He had the door of the tabernacle facing the east. He had it facing the east. Why the east? See, when you begin to understand the east wind, from Genesis right up to Revelation, it's analyzed the word east and east wind. Every time the Bible talks about the east wind, he talks about judgment. Always, very consistent. It was so consistent that you couldn't help noticing it. The east wind is mentioned in Genesis 41 when it talks about the east wind causing the famine in Egypt. The east wind blighting uh, all those corn or all those uh, wheat that were there. It was the east wind that brought in destruction. It was the east wind that brought in judgment. It was the east wind that caused a drought. It was the east wind that caused the famine. It was, it was a wind of judgment. The east wind. Let's look carefully at what this east wind can symbolize and what it can mean. We just take a few Bible examples over in the book of Genesis 41. Genesis 41. And you notice here, this is not the only time, but Several other times. Genesis 41. In Pharaoh's dream, verse 23, he says, Behold, seven heads withered, thin and blighted by the east wind, sprang up after them. So he talks about the east wind and how it brought a judgment and a destruction. The east wind throughout the Israelite period always represents a wind that was hard, that was judgmental. And that east wind is the spirit of, is the spirit of counsel and might. Why counsel and might? Because that same spirit of counsel and might is the same anointing that Jesus had when he went out and he destroyed the works of the devil. So that people say of him in the Gospel of Mark chapter 6, how did this man get these mighty works? First John 3 verse 8 tells us that the Son of God was manifest to destroy the works of the devil. Now we are talking about his works, the devil's works. And as Jesus was about to go to the cross, in the Gospel of John, he says, A time, now is a time when the prince of this world will be cast out, will be judged. This wind is a wind of judgment. And it talks about pulling down strongholds. It talks about paving the way, preparing the way of God. That's the first flavor of prophets. They are prophets whom God called like the east wind. Elijah was an east wind prophet. And east wind prophets come forth and they confront. They tear down. They remove. And notice, what John the Baptist did, that is what they have in common. They were both east wind prophets. When John the Baptist came, the Bible tells us that he had the spirit of Elijah on his life and the gospel of Luke. Let's look over the gospel of Luke. And some of the prophecies 
of what John the Baptist will fulfill and do. Gospel of Luke, chapter 3. It's a prophecy, John the Baptist, but John the Baptist. And it says in verse 4, As it is written in the book of the words of Isaiah, the prophet saying, The voice of one crying in the wilderness, Prepare the way of the Lord, Make his path straight. Every valley shall be filled, and every mountain and hill brought low. And the crooked place shall be made straight, and the rough ways made smooth. And all flesh shall see the salvation of God. Then he said to the multitudes that came out to be baptized by him. Notice this is East Wind prophet talking. He says, Brood of vipers! You ever met East Wind prophets? Don't go near them. <laughs> this is East Wind prophet talking. He says, You brood of vipers! And he says, Who want you to come? To, to flee from the wrath to come? You must remember that those people who came to be baptized by him were people who were sort of acknowledging their, uh, their sin. And they're coming, some of them were possibly Pharisees and all that. And they came, you know, accepting the repentance. Here they came to receive his baptism. Here he scolds them. That is why some prophets got scolding ministry. Pray for them. They need a little bit of soft wind. Right? We call them the one-winded prophet. They only got his wind. Now, Elijah had more than the east wind, but primarily he was an east wind. And the east wind comes and he blows across the place. And he brings destruction of idols, of things that stand in the way against God. Notice Elijah's first ministry was destructive. He went and he said, There will be no rain! Except at my word. What a prophet. Everybody wants rain, he don't want rain. What kind of prophet is he? He's been prophet. Counsel and might. And you notice this. He's been prophets demonstrate power. Now you don't find Jeremiah demonstrating power in healing. Have you noticed that? The only prophets you see demonstrate healing power are Elijah and Elisha. And Moses as he prayed for his sister Miriam. What about the other prophets? Daniel didn't demonstrate healing power. John the Baptist didn't heal anybody. But he had other areas of power. You see, there are different, remember there are different degrees of moving into that wind. Although John the Baptist had the spirit of Elijah, he... He, was, he himself says he was not the Elijah to come. But Jesus said he was. What does the scripture say? There is still an Elijah to come before the Jewish dispensation who really demonstrate the kind of power that Elijah demonstrated. Stop the rain, start the rain. Call the fire, send this, send that. See, might. We are talking about counsel and might. An East Wind prophet brings forth the ministry with might. In its highest extent, there is healing power, miraculous power demonstrated. Although Elijah demonstrated miraculous power, yet there were only what I call incidences in which it was demonstrated. There were at least about eight incidents. And you see it happening in uh, Elisha's life twice, the account. These are different types of prophets. Totally different. They have might. Why do they need it? Because you need that might to confront demonic powers. You need some East Wind prophets. So when you begin to see this flavor of prophets... And you, we understand that 
they need to work together. You need the four winds to create a revival. Why? Because if all the time you got east wind, everything bota, nothing left. Do you know that John the Baptist ministry without Jesus will be incomplete? The east wind prophet cannot function by themselves. If they function by themselves, they function. <laughs> no more function and no more unction. And if you are ever called to be a prophet, if you are one of those east wind ones, please work together with south wind, west wind, north wind. Because you'll be too extreme. No east wind prophet can function by themselves. Remember this. They cannot. They are supposed to prepare the way for others if they are purely east wind. They are to prepare the way for others and another must come in order to cause revival. It takes four winds to bring revival. One wind is not enough. Then you have the second flavor of prophets, the west wind. The west wind. The west wind is seldom mentioned in the Bible. But it's mentioned at least at one time in the Bible in the book of Exodus chapter 10. Let's look at Exodus chapter 10 and understand what the west wind does. Exodus chapter 10. And uh, we are only talking about prophets, right? We could have a whole teaching on the fivefold ministries. Not all fivefold ministries are divided that way. When you talk, talk about apostolic ministries, you find there are only two categories and two types. And now that the two types... You know, the, the, uh, the twelfth type, the Petrine type, and the Pauline type. The Pauline type is divided into several other types. Then when you talk about pastoral ministries, there are again different categories. When you talk about evangelists, there are again different categories. When you talk about teachers, there are different categories again. So this categorizing is specialized in the four winds in prophets. In the book of Exodus chapter 10, let's look at the book of Exodus chapter 10. And we look at verse 19. And the Lord turned a very strong west wind, which took the locusts away and blew them into the Red Sea. There remained not one locust in all the territory of Egypt. Now, Scripture must be consistently interpreted. If you interpret natural, it's natural. You interpret allegorical, the allegory must be consistent. What do I mean by consistency? For example, in the Bible, if a dog represents something not so good, then in Genesis it's the same, in Exodus it's the same, in Matthew it's the same, in Luke it's the same, in Revelation it's the same. You cannot have it changing all the time. Let me give a more clear-cut example. A snake in the Bible always represents something bad. Whether it's a black black snake, purple snake, white snake, rainbow snake. It still represents something bad. Now, a locust in the Bible always represents demonic powers. It is used that way in the book of Revelation. It's used that way in the book of uh, Joel. It's used that way consistently as demonic powers. And so we have a natural interpretation and a spiritual interpretation. The West Wind always brings deliverance. The East Wind deals with the works of Satan. The West Wind deals with Satan and his cohorts themselves. So that is why the west wind and the east wind flow together. The west wind is the spirit of deliverance. It's the spirit of knowledge and of the fear of the Lord. Where is the connection? Because the fear of the Lord and knowledge are intimately connected. You either have the fear of God or the fear of the devil and man. You cannot have either. When the fear of God fills your life, you have no other fear in your life but God. But the word fear of the Lord is not the other word 
You know, the Hebrew word paka, which means terror, is the other Hebrew word yira, which talks about a reverential fear. God is not there to terrify you. you no, know, anytime you do the wrong thing, it's going to ketok you. God is not there to terrify you. No, anytime you do the wrong thing, it's going to ketok you. Anytime. No, it's not that, that kind of terror. It's the awesome feeling. The awesomeness of God. That reverential respect that we have for Him. And Paul always connects the spirit of a sound mind with freedom from fear. For God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of love, of power, and a sound mind. Spirit of knowledge and of the fear of the Lord delivers us. Do you know that Satan can only hit you if you don't have knowledge? It's connected. Ignorance is to his advantage. And at any time if Satan wants to work anything, he has to deal through deception. He does not have any power since Jesus took it off at the cross. And Satan's only strategy is through deception. If he could convince you he has the power, you have, you have sort of surrendered your rights to him. And so knowledge and the fear of the Lord are important in terms of deliverance. Now, who has that kind of ministry in the Bible? How is it connected? Turn to the book of Psalms, chapter 32, verse 7. Psalms 32, verse 7. And we begin to see how all this connects together in the other flavor of prophets. Psalms 32, verse 7. David says, You are my hiding place. You shall preserve me from trouble. You shall surround me with songs of deliverance. When you begin to talk about knowledge and the fear of the Lord, you will have to talk about worship. You will have to talk about worship. The songs of deliverance that God brings forth. Knowledge and the fear of God in our lives. So you could go about in any secular office and if you begin to worship God, there's an awesomeness that begins to fill the place. Worship brings the awesome presence of God. And uh, there is Two prophets, one of them is David. And they move into what I call, even though David was not a full-fledged prophet, uh, prophet, he was primarily a king. Being a prophet was a sideline for him. Yet David moved into what I call the West Wind. Through his life, he was able in the natural to conquer all the enemies of Israel. Because of him, Solomon became a man of peace. David is well known as a man of war. He made war with his songs. He warfare with his songs. Psalms 150. Look at the book of Psalms 150. Hundred and forty nine, that's right. <clears throat> it says here verse six. Psalms hundred and forty nine verse six. Let the high praises of God be in their mouth, and a two edged sword in their hand, to execute vengeance on the nations and punishments on the peoples, to bind their kings with chains and their nobles with fetters of iron, to execute on them the written judgment, this honor, have all his saints. Now the west wind also looks like a judgment, but it's judgment on the person of Satan and his cohorts. 
The east wind is a judgment on the works of Satan. The west wind is a spirit of deliverance. And it always accompanies with the songs of deliverance. So when a person is called to be a prophet, they have to first determine, is it Chozeh or Nabi? Once they get past that, then they got to determine whether it's vanilla, chocolate, strawberry or durian. We will leave East Wind as durian flavor. <laughs> then we got to determine all the other flavors in God. And uh, if they are West Wind prophet, they will be able to move into the songs of the living. That's your key mark. The key mark of an East Wind prophet is might. Demonstration of miraculous power. Demonstration of miraculous power. The key mark of a West Wind prophet is the demonstration of deliverance through songs and their ministry deliver, sets free. Not necessarily in what we people call the ministry of deliverance, but the deliverance comes in songs. Look over at the book of Judges chapter 4. There's another prophet, and this happens to be a lady, in Judges chapter 4. This is a lady prophet, and she is a west wind prophet. Deborah. Judges chapter 4, verse 4. Now Deborah, a prophetess, the wife of Lepidoth, was judging Israel... At that time. So, Deborah was a prophetess. And she had a ministry where God anointed her specially to set the Israelites free from the chains of bondage. And in fact, Barak, her co-worker, had to obtain courage from her. And notice what they did after they won in chapter 5, verse 1. Deborah and Barak, the son of Abinoim, sang on that day, saying, When leaders lead in Israel, when the people willingly offer themselves, bless the Lord. And they sang songs of deliverance. Hear, O kings, give ear, O princes. I, even I, will sing to the Lord. I will sing praise to the Lord God of Israel. And uh, verse 7, Village life sees, it sees in Israel, Ante I, Deborah, arose, arose a mother in Israel. Uh, here was a prophetess with an anointing as a west wind prophetess. And she was used by God as an instrument to deliver people, to set people free, to break bondages over people's lives. Very similar to East Wind, but slightly different. Because the West Wind comes with a gentleness. The gentleness comes in what I call songs. The songs that flow forth. See, through her encouragement, Barak was able to go forth. Through the gentleness that they bring forth. Songs of deliverance. They are able to break bondages in people's lives. West Wind prophets tend to minister very deeply to people. Very, very deeply. To the inner bondages in their lives. And they are able to deliver people from the curse of the Lord. And in David's life, not only did he destroy all the enemies of Israel, but he was able to amass a vast storehouse of treasures and prosperity for use by King Solomon. West wind prophets. Then we have the south wind prophets. South wind prophets have a specific word different from all the others. Let's look over in the Bible and uh, we will consider the south wind. And this time, we we'll look at the book of Zechariah in the Minor Prophets. Chapter 14, Zechariah chapter 14, it's 
we begin to understand that each of these prophets have their classifications, we begin to understand how God works through all these different prophets, harmonizing together His work. Zechariah, right? Now, before we look at chapter 14, let's look over chapter 9. 14 talks about his second coming. And give you the verses where the south wind is mentioned in verse 14. Then the Lord will be seen over them, and his arrow will go forth like lightning. The Lord God will blow the trumpet and go with whirlwinds from the south. Now, notice whirlwinds from the south. If you look at verse 14 very carefully, there are continuation of verse 12 and verse 13. What was he talking about? Look at verse 13. Return to the stronghold, you prisoners of hope. Even today I declare that I will restore double to you. A south wind always brings about restoration. South wind prophets are restoration prophets. Now you can see the order now why we started with the east. You cannot restore until you remove. That is why God starts with the east wind. John the Baptist, primarily an east wind, pull down all those things, make his path straight. Elijah coming forth to confront Israel in his darkest hour. You must remember why Elijah shined like a bright star. Because of all the kings in Israel, the worst was Ahab. The worst was Ahab with his wife Jezebel. And they were the most infamous of all the Israelite kings that ever arose in the northern kingdom. At its darkest hour, God sent forth a strong, powerful East Wind prophet who in his ministry entirely destroyed a great portion of the false Baal prophets. You read about that in 1 Kings chapter 19. See, the East Wind must come first. See, the wind, the four winds of the Spirit, which I have taught before in a series, they have a certain order of coming. If you bring the south wind first before the east wind, the people will take the well and use it for the wrong things. So you need the east wind to blow first, to remove all obstacles to God. And when the east wind has blown through, when an east wind prophet blow through here and minister to your churches, minister to your, to your peoples, minister to the church, when the east wind prophet has finished, everyone also finished. Everything in us that is not of God, anything in the flesh is cut away. And we sometimes need prophet like that. Because sometimes people will not pay attention to a prophet who is very nice like the South Wind. South Wind prophets are all very nice. Mellow and nice, gentle. You know? Don't worry lah, that says the Lord. No, once in a while you need an east wind coming about to blow and blow across the place until we all humble before God. Until we realize where we have compromised. Until we realize all the small, small things that we are putting up with that God is not going to allow anymore. And when we are all finished, then the West Wind prophet comes along and then sings those songs of deliverance. Hallelujah. I mean, we are beginning to gain strength. You see, once you pull down everything, you have to build your defense. The west wind builds your defense around you. It builds your defenses. Because when you destroy the enemy, your, your, your defenseless is still not good. So the songs of deliverance come forth. It removes the person who has Satan forever. It removes a clear deliverance. Remove all the inhabitants or the habitations of spirits that have made themselves at home. Why? Because you, you could pray for a person to be healed, but if they have a demonic spirit that they are keeping as a hobby, say, do people do that? Yes. Sometimes when we minister to people, you know, God has revealed you know, that there are certain things that they are allowing in their homes, 
and it could be an object of art. Now, please don't go to the extreme. I know that there are those who are very extreme. You know, everything that, that, that they feel is unscriptural until Christmas also cannot celebrate. And they try to tie it to the wrong things. So they say, you don't celebrate Christmas. Uh, what do you call Monday? They say Monday. What do you call Tuesday? Tuesday. What do you call Wednesday? Wednesday. They say, do you know that some of those days are called after the God? They say, what, 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 what? So if you want to be strict about that, call it first day, second day, third day. And you'll be the only cook in town who does it. <laughs> then we ask them, what do you call January? January. What do you call February? February. What do you call March? March. Don't you know those are names of false gods too? So how strict do you want to be strict? And then some people, you know, if they go to the supermarket, they buy a few things and the plastic bag got some of these Chinese New Year thing, you know, dragons and phoenix. Even though they got a lot of things to carry in their plastic bags, when they near the house, they empty everything, leave the dragon plastic bag outside, <laughs> and slowly walk in, you know. That is ridiculous. Ridiculous. Now, personally, I would not keep any of these objects that remind me of the wrong things. But we must differentiate between normal things that happen to represent some of these things and a real, what I call, a charm or something that is used in demon worship. A resemblance alone is no excuse. I mean... I mean, if you're a neat person, you live in a HDB flat, you want to keep some of those plastic bags to throw rubbish. Tie up, throw down. Now, isn't it more nicer throw down the dragon? <laughs> so what's a big fuss? You know? And these people are not concerned about the whole body of Christ. They're only concerned about their, what I call, tangent, off-tangent doctrine. Because if you travel around like, like me and you go all over the place, you, you begin to understand the balance people need to have. Like if you go to Thailand and you know what a Thai, have you ever seen what a Thai passport looks like? There's the image of Buddha on every page. What are you going to do? Travel without a passport? So you can see how impractical some of these people reach that, that wrong, wrong, wrong extreme. And uh, you know, sometimes, if you really want to be extreme, everything you can see a demon. Even you buy the shirt, crocodile label, crocodile spirit. <laughs> right. Everything. I remember one, one dear sister who fell into some of these wrong teaching, and uh, then she reached a place, you know, she bought one, one dress or something, and, uh, and the, there were designs, and on one corner, some strange looking design. And she was so caught up in this wrong teaching, that, you know, it was her, her, her house clothes, and uh, she saw that thing, and she got the scissors and cut a small hole around the design. <laughs> and so, one day while she was walking about the house, and I was just happening to be there, I said, what, what's that small hole doing in your dress? <laughs> she says, it's a long story. <laughs> but she says she'll never do it again. She realized the difference. Now, I'm not talking about extremes, alright? But there are in some cases really demonic objects. That Paul differentiates between normal going to the, sup- going to the supermarket and eating or all this, asking no questions, and those things that have to do with demons. He even differentiates that. You can read the book of 1 Corinthians. In our culture, it's very important to differentiate that. You see, we have to differentiate between anything that is of worship and anything that is culture. And remember that through generations, some things that are worship die off and only the culture remains. So, there is a line that is drawn and some things through the time are constantly passing across that line. Just like you go to Malacca, there's a special dish, I don't know its origin, but it's called Devil's Curry. <laughs> so why do they name it? Only the devil will eat it. <laughs> but some of you may have eaten Devil's Curry. That doesn't, because you eat Devil's Curry doesn't make you a devil. It has become a delicacy. 
I never tried though, but it must be pretty hot. <laughs> Mooncake started as a worship thousands of years ago. It was originally. But through time, that has died off. Now it's primarily a cultural thing. Not many people, you know, look up at the moon and worship, you know, Neil Armstrong's footprint up there. Right? <laughs> they don't do it anymore, not, not that much. Right? Because most of us, we have grown up in science and we know what's going on. But most people still enjoy eating mooncakes. Right? And, and just because you eat a mooncake doesn't mean you become demon possessed. Feel with the spirit of the moon. So let's draw a line. There are people who are against what I call uh, uh, Chinese culture, which I think you must even say, if it's cultural things, no problem. If it's things that do with your conscience and worship, then it's different. And people will have respect for that. But being a Christian doesn't mean that you become a non-Indian or non-Chinese. Although we believe that there's only one race, yet we all have different cultures. For, for one thing, we recognize when you travel overseas, right, they wear their shoes in, we leave our shoes out. <laughs> There's a lot of cultural difference. We've got to admit it. And those things are still there. And we need to say if they're not so important, well, we can just accept it and flow along with it. No problem. So this, therefore, there's nothing wrong with giving Ang Pao. <laughs> Right. Some of you are glad because you want Ang Pao to to lie. <laughs> so and so there's nothing wrong. It has become a culture. And they enjoy it. And my children they enjoy it. We we don't worship and all these things, but for the children it's fun. Christmas is fun. Right? They took look to a family time together. Sing carols together, remember about Jesus. Although he's not officially born on 25th, but at least it's a good time to get together. However, the world misuses it, we can use it for the right things. And the same with Chinese New Year holiday. You know, for my children, my Chinese, New Year, uh, Christmas time, you know, they have the Christmas tree lighted up, all excited, singing carols. They just start playing carols. Then when Chinese New Year time, they say, Where's the Chinese New Year tree? <laughs> and I ask, what Chinese New Year tree? <laughs> and they say, oh, that tree, you know, that, that, that we tie all the red packets around it. I say, that's something new. Maybe in 20 years' time, they will have a Chinese New Year tree, right? But it has become a culture. The same like in the Indian, they have the traditions too. There are some things that are worshipped as something like their culture. Like, uh, in... For the Indians, right, sometimes they, they have what I call uh, this custom of the ladies putting this dot right in between the eye, on their forehead. Right? Now, at one time, it was purely worship. And the, the type of thing they used for the dot was always 100% of the time taken from the temple. But through time and through scientific advances... <laughs> Now, they sell all kinds of places that have nothing to do with worship. I know because half of my church are Indians. We have a very good, well-mixed area. And, and we have no cultural problems at all because we see one another in Christ. And so I used to fellowship with them, talk with them, eat their curries too. <laughs> and so... Time has changed when now they, they take this dot for the Indian ladies. They wear the nice looking saris. When it's a purple sari, they put purple dot. <laughs> matching, matching. <laughs> it has become a culture. A culture. And for them, it makes a difference uh, whether a woman is married or not married. The dot tells something. And uh, so it has become a fashion, fashion for them. So it's something that we, we, 
must not say, go against this, go against that. Christianity is not going against everything. We are giving a wrong impression to people. And uh, if you really want to follow the Bible and Bible custom, why don't you wear robes? Instead of coats, right? Even our suits today are from the Western culture, right? But it's something easy. I mean, it's much easier to wear this than the sarong and preach. So we recognize that, you know, there are certain things, there are culture, there's there's no problem with that. And we are living at a time when there's a thin line and there's one side worship, one side culture. Whenever it crosses the line of culture, if it doesn't offend your conscience, no problem. But in each society and in each nation, they must determine what is still worship, what is still culture. Perhaps if you go to India and certain areas, certain things that we may consider culture is worship. Certain things that worship culture. So we must, what I call, contextualize. And flow with the Spirit of God. Which is why the Apostle Paul says, you know, in circumstances like this, this is the better decision. The way Paul handles situation. So we have discerned that at times, that sometimes when a person uh, is prayed for, and sometimes the Spirit of God has revealed that they have certain things that have to do with demonic worship. And then they are set free, but every time it lasts only a small certain time. Then after that, the same problem comes again and again until they remove the object that attracts and welcomes the demons into the home. So we are talking about certain objects, not all objects. So we are talking about Deliverance. See, you could bring healing to a person, it's win. But unless the cause and the source is removed by the west wind, you will have a perpetual problem. And that is why when God's east wind come along and remove all those things that block him, God wants to hit the very source and remove Satan and his cohorts by the west wind. He builds songs of deliverance around us so that no demons can penetrate anymore. And demons cannot feel at home anymore because their home becomes the home of God. The west wind brings songs of deliverance. Then comes the south wind. See, after you have done all these things, you have removed those wrong works, you have removed the source of the spiritual uh, problems, you're still not restored yet. Restoration is to put back in what was taken. That's why the south wind prophet needs to come. And when the south wind prophet comes, he brings restoration. I will restore. God talks about the south wind. And the south wind is a restorative wind. It's a prophetic office that brings forth restoration and that kind of restoration restoration can take form in many many ways restoration of the people to their land restoration of the riches where they have been robbed it's a restorative move that God is bringing forth in the south wind now there are prophets that primarily function as south wind prophets south wind prophets tend to be those who bring what I quote and quote call prosperity and other forms of restoration. Abraham was known as a prophet in Genesis chapter 20. And uh, let's look at Genesis chapter 20 so that we will know that he is a prophet. In Genesis chapter 20, verse 7, Now therefore, Restore the man's wife, for he is a prophet. God told Abimelech, Abraham is a prophet. So we know he's established in a prophet's office. What kind of prophet was he? South wind, east wind? He, he was a south wind prophet. You will notice that in Genesis 15, God gave him a powerful prophecy about his descendants. In Genesis 15, God said to Abraham, in uh, verse, looking at verse, uh, 
13. Know certainly that your descendants will be strangers in a land that is not theirs and will serve them, and they will afflict them 400 years. And also the nation whom they serve, I will judge afterward, they shall come out with great possessions. Now, Abraham was a prophet. He was a South Wind prophet. South Wind prophets prosper themselves and cause blessing and prosperity to come into people's lives. So Abraham was such a prophet. It's told by us in the book of Genesis that Abraham became one of the richest persons in that area. God blessed him. And isn't it true that the Bible says that Abraham will be a blessing to all nations? That's how powerful his prophetic office was. He will end up a blessing. In fact, this was a special blessing in Genesis 15 that God gave to him. And this blessing was going to last right up to the fourth generation. And God says, in the fourth generation, when I bring your descendants out, I will bless them mightily. And we read that story in Exodus chapter 12, when the Israelites were coming out of the land of Egypt, they demanded, the word asked is the word demanded from the Egyptians, gold and silver, and they plundered the Egyptians, and they came out. So they came out restored in God. If the Israelites had only had the east wind, then they would have what I call the destruction and Pharaoh full stop. They will still be in Egypt. If the Israelites had the west wind then, and the east wind, they would have the Pharaoh and all his cohorts destroyed and they would be delivered out of Egypt but with nothing in their pockets. But because the Israelites were restored, east wind came, west wind came, South wind came, so they were restored. They, they, had, they had all those bondages broken in their life. They were set free, and Pharaoh was destroyed. They were delivered. Songs of deliverance came, and they were set free. And the south wind was also blowing, and they came out with wealth. Great wealth. That's restoration taking place in their life. Daniel was another south wind prophet. And uh, before we look at Daniel, let's look over at the book of uh, uh, Job, chapter 37, verse 17. Job 37, verse 17. Now, we did not give all the necessary verses for the others, but if you want, you're taking down notes, you can uh, take down some of these other verses. For those on East Wind, you could also take down Jeremiah 18, verse 17, and uh, Zah chapter 28, and uh, verse 7. But here we are talking about South Wind. Those two are East Wind. In uh, Job chapter 37, we are looking at verse 17. Why are your garments hot when he quiets the earth by the South Wind? See, the south wind sort of restores, quietens. In the book of Songs, Songs of Solomon, chapter 4, verse 16. And any scholar who has studied the Song of Solomon realized that it's the story that allegorizes the bride of Christ and Jesus, and Jesus Christ himself. That's the prophecy that is found in the book of uh, Song of Solomon. And all those pictures there, we realize... They could point to Jesus and point to the bride of Jesus Christ, the church. And in those pictures, you do find the winds of God. So let's look at the book of Songs of Solomon, chapter 4, verse 16. And here, Shulamite is saying in verse 16, Awake, O north wind. And come, O south. Do you notice you never ask the east and the west to come? It's very consistent. I mean, if she says, Awake, O east wind, she'll be bota. 
See, the Bible is so consistent when you begin to study the winds of God. Say, awake, O sovereign. Because the sovereign is very restorative. Awake, O sovereign. And uh, blow upon my garden. That its spices may flow out. Let my beloved come to his garden and eat its pleasant fruits. So the south wind brings prosperity, produce, fragrance, blessing. That's the south wind prophet coming in. In the book of Daniel, let's look at the book of Daniel who is a south wind prophet. And you notice all these south wind prophets always, quote unquote, looks like they have an easy life. They don't walk about like the east wind type with camel's hair and eat locusts. <laughs> right? Now, when we begin to look at these flavors of prophets, some of you are praying, God, make me a south wind prophet. Right? I'm sorry you can't choose in these areas. Some areas we can choose, some areas we cannot. And... Uh, you say, oh, that's too bad. But if God called you to be Ephraim prophet, you will love locusts. And you will love to dress in camel skin. The book of Daniel, chapter 9. Daniel, chapter 9. Now, Daniel being a sovereign prophet, his ministry, although singular, and very private away from the public eye has a powerful impact on his nation. You see, you don't have to be known all over the world. You have to only be known by God to be effective. You could do more in a close sight in God's presence and have your name written and fame up there in heaven rather than on earth. We need to recognize that. When we all get to heaven, there will be a lot of surprises. The people, you see, today, do you know how people qualify a success in a man of God? By the reports and magazine. It's published by Christian. If their names do not come out in the, in the Christian papers or magazines, we are classified them as unknown or ineffective. But there are a lot of things happening that are not reported. And because America has always emphasized on the media, it's sometimes misused. You see, the Christian media should do this in, in the magazine area and re Christian reporting. You should be looking at what God has done and then bringing it forth to the rest of the body of Christ. Rather than using the media to build up somebody who is not doing anything and putting a person in the public eye and enlarging a person's outreach and from that build his ministry. And today that's how people are using the media. Not as a means of information, but as a platform to take off in your ministry. It's a misuse of Christian media. The Christian media is supposed to be a report, not a platform. But it's being used as a platform. The TV and everything has been used as a platform. Whether you get on TV or not, doesn't make you successful in God. It's doing what God wants you to do. Now I have letters coming back to me from the state. I have offers and this publishers offers and, and they say that they publish all my books, promote all my books, and open thousands of doors for me in the state. And I pray to the Lord, say, God, that's not the way I want my ministry to go. And it's a well-known person who wrote to me, because he's selling my books. I said, I pray I don't have a release in my spirit to get this person who wants to publish my books over there. I don't have a release. I said, I'm not looking for open doors. I have enough work here for God to do. If God wants me to be there, I'll go there. And anyway, I do plan to be there under my responsibilities in some of the organizations that I'm part of. But I said, I'm not looking for doors to open. I'm not looking for a platform to preach. I only want to do God's will. 
God knows my heart. I've told that to my church. I've told that to my co-pastors. And I've told that even in my meetings here. And I said, if, if I could have it my way, I would just like to be alone in a farm, spend all my time praying and studying the Bible, and just writing, writing, research, prayer, and uh, just away from all these things, and just be with God. My favorite hobby, prayer. Being with God. And uh, I, I love that. And I just love, like Elijah, just to stand in God's presence. And that's what's, what's important. But if you have been in Christianity long enough, you see a lot of politics going on. And I know that sometimes in certain organizations and positions, people go after that and they say, no, what's the use of going after all these things? These are not the things that make a man of God. A man of God is produced in a factory up there, not down here. Praise God. Just be what you are in God. And so I said, I want it God's way, revival. If God moves, there will be life that flows forth. We don't want just a media. We want life. People are hungry. In fact, the Christian world is sick and tired of the media. So is the secular world. Christians are crying out for reality. That's what we need to bring to them. So Daniel, even though he's away from the public eye, privately in his life as a prophet in Daniel chapter 9, it tells you in verse 2 that in the first year of his reign, King Darius' reign, Daniel understood by the books the number of the years specified by the word of the Lord given to Jeremiah the prophet that he would accomplish 70 years in the desolation of Jerusalem. When Daniel saw it, he began to give himself to fasting and to prayer. He began to ask God to restore the people of Israel. Remember, he is a restorative prophet. He did not need to go to the Israelites and restore them himself. He did not go to the public media and restore them and, and speak on behalf. He went to God by his position as a man of God and a prophet of God. And he himself studied prophecies by other prophets. And he realized and he was a man who discerned the times and seasons. See, sometimes it's only by virtue of your position. As we say, there are seven rivers of prophecy. And we have said, second river is by virtue of your position. By virtue of your position, you sometimes can tell the times of, and seasons that are right for certain things. And Daniel know the times and seasons. I'm sure the Israelite, the rest of the Israelite have the prophecy of Jeremiah. But he was the only one recorded who knew that the time and season is right. Because he, was, he had a prophetic office. He could discern times and seasons. And he prayed to God to restore the Israelites. He prayed to God for forgiveness. And God heard his cry. God explained to him what the full restoration is like in what the 70 years represent. But as a result of Daniel's ministry privately, something began to take place right where he was. Remember, Daniel is a right-hand man at the Middle Persian Empire. He was a prime minister and he was also a prophet. And being a person of prayer, he could pray through. I don't know whether he did anything privately with a king, but I doubt so. I don't think he did anything. He only went to God. But something began to take place in the heart of Cyrus. If you study Bible history, you realize that the Middle Persian Empire was a dual reign. Cyrus and Darius reigned together. They were co-kings together. It was called the Middle Persian Empire. And it says in the first year, in verse 1, of Darius, the Mede, Turn over to Ezra chapter 1. Turn over to Ezra chapter 1. The book of Ezra chapter 1. 
and see the impact of Daniel's ministry in the circle that he moved in. The book of Ezra, chapter 1, verse 1. Noting that in historical records, it is about the same time period. Ezra chapter 1 verse 1. In the first year of Cyrus, king of Persia, that the word of the Lord spoken by the mouth of Jeremiah might be fulfilled, the Lord stirred up the spirit of Cyrus, king of Persia. Now that's powerful. Because... Daniel was the one who prayed for. Daniel was stirred first. And then Cyrus. We know it has to be that way because when Daniel was weeping, the king had not done anything yet. The command has not gone forth yet. And in fact, the angel revealed to Daniel that from the going forth of the command until such and such a time, the Messiah will come. And after Daniel's intercession privately, something took place publicly. If the Bible didn't record this, we were taught that that was by accident. It was not. It was Daniel the prophet's private south wind ministry. And there's no doubt that Daniel was a good example. Daniel served, and the Darius loved him. I'm sure, so did Cyrus. And he was a fantastic example. And he may have put words here and there that would turn the heart of the kings to sympathize and have compassion on the Jews. So powerful was his ministry. And God put him at the right place at the right time. That's important. And just to encourage you, Daniel started his prophetic ministry pretty late. Because it tells you his first vision in the book of Daniel was recorded only after... His early years had passed. His first vision is recorded in the book of Daniel, chapter 7. In the first year of Belshazzar. That's after Nebuchadnezzar died. And Belshazzar, although he was called the son of Nebuchadnezzar, you must know how they commonly use words like son of David, son of this, even though he was great-grandson or great-great-grandson. In historical records, if you're a scholar... He's actually the great, uh, uh, not just the son, but the son of the son. So you can imagine how old Daniel was by that time. Before he moved into that full-fledged prophetic office as a chosen prophet who saw these visions in God. So God has his time frame that we need to flow along. And it was important for Daniel to move into that right at that time because that was critical. If Daniel failed or succeed, it would mean the failure of the entire nation. So powerful and important was his position. That's the sovereign prophet bringing restoration. And Daniel was one of those who had plenty of wealth in his own life. In position, he had no lack. Because he was a south wind prophet that brings restoration. Now for all the winds, the most dramatic and the most powerful is the north wind. Because the north wind brings the presence of God. Now you begin to see the pattern. The east wind removes the works of Satan. The west wind removes Satan. The south wind restores our goods and all the works of God in our life. And the north wind restores God into our lives. That seals the four winds of God. In the book of Proverbs 25, verse 23, there's a statement made about the north wind. Proverbs chapter 25, verse 23.
and he says here, the north wind brings forth rain. Well, the second part is no, it's something more to do with personal life. But I want you to see his illustration. The understanding of Solomon and all the Israelites is the north wind brings forth rain. If you have the old King James translation, it puts the north wind driver away the rain. It's time to change your Bible. The old King James is fantastic, but it was based and translated when the understanding of Hebrew was not that deep. And I have been using the old King James for years and years. Until I began to teach systematically through the Bible. And there were many times when, because I checked into the Hebrew, I checked into the Greek, when I said, this is not what the Hebrew is saying. This is not what, this is not, it does, it's not accurate enough. And that was when I went on a deep search for the next translation. Because I knew if I change, there will be a huge Bible sale for my church. The whole church will change. And... Uh, so I did a one-year research into all translations. And I checked in every modern translation that recommends. And in the end, I settled for the New King James. Still not too happy. It still can improve, but you know, it's the best that I feel could go around. The New King James. And uh, so you notice that the actual translation, if they wanted to translate, they should have put it, the north wind driveth the rain. They could put away and it gives the opposite direction. But the Hebrew, which this brings forth very clearly, it actually drives this way. Old King James going to put drive that way. <laughs> so please change it to this way. <laughs> and so it brings forth rain. Now rain symbolizes. See, all these figures are symbols. Rain always symbolizes revival. We talk about the former rain and the latter rain. So I'm talking about four winds. There are lightnings, there are thunders. All these symbolize different things. There are a whole study in them. And giving you sermon material. Go and do research on thunders. There are seven thunders. <laughs> Thank you for the thunder. Right? But that's another topic altogether. Right? And there are lightnings. And all these things, they are symbols that have to do with last day move. The north wind. Notice in Ezekiel chapter 1. Ezekiel chapter 1. And uh, as Ezekiel was having a vision of God. We notice that he saw Almighty God in His presence manifest. What I want you to notice was the direction it came from. In Ezekiel chapter 1, in verse 4, Then I look, and behold, a whirlwind. I tell you, all these things we are touching on, it will be good to have a good song on that. We wait for Tim to get it. Hallelujah. <laughs> you know, if we have singers today who can catch hold of revelational truth and put it into song, it will really bring something to God's people and move into prophetic song. John Wesley has his Charles Wesley. So, four wind prophets have their four wind singers. These are tremendous truths. And uh, we pray for God to raise up worship leaders. Because worship will always be... I have another series of teaching on the seven feasts. And we time the seven feasts. We are now in the feast of trumpets. Trumpets to many people. I heard many people teach on seven feasts. They always put the feast of trumpets as evangelism. It includes evangelism. But trumpets actually symbolize praise and worship. You read about 120 prophet, uh, uh, trumpets in Second Chronicles, chapter 5, when the trumpeters were as one with the singers. The trumpets symbolized praise and worship. And you read in the book of Numbers, 
when the two silver trumpets were made, the trumpets were always blown over all the burnt offerings and sacrifices. Always symbolized praise and worship. We are in that time. And if you are a new person singing songs, or your new composition, you notice, you know, in our church we have people, new singers composing songs. And you notice, you're a new singer, you run out of vocabulary. I love you, Lord. I adore you, Lord. I praise you, Lord. You know, bless you, Lord. And after that, don't know what else to sing. And then when you read David's life, the songs he sings are so deep. See, what we need are songs that have revelational depth. They have theology inside. See, most of our songs are very shallow. No? Lord, I love you. I love you. I love you. Lord, I bless you. You know? We put it in about 4, 5, 10, 20 tunes. You must remember God the Father is receiving on the receiving end. He sits on his throne up there and he hears this fellow say, I love you. This fellow say, I love you. I love you. I love you. Right. And the Father God looks down and says, Don't these people know anything else? What about all my revelations I gave to them? And when you look at King David, the depth of songs he sang are fantastic. And here are the weird wind, the north wind. And here he talks about the weird wind that comes from God in verse 4, the north wind. The weird wind was coming out of the north, a great cloud with raging fire engulfing its head, and brightness was all around it. The north wind symbolizes the presence of God. The north wind is the spirit of the Lord. The east wind was a spirit of counsel and might. The west wind was a spirit of knowledge and the fear of the Lord, Lord. The south wind was a spirit of wisdom and understanding. Why? Because in wisdom and in understanding you will gather well and restoration. And in wisdom and in understanding you will preserve yourself from sin. You have spiritual well. And now the north wind the Spirit of the Lord. The presence that comes from Almighty God. And I tell you, we need north wind prophets. And in the last days, God is going to cause the north wind to be the strongest wind. Because each one of these, east wind, west wind and south wind have their place. You would notice that in the 1950s, when William Branham came on the scene of the healing revival, he was a miracle evangelist and prophet, East Wind. And he tore down a lot of things. And he brought forth a lot of shaking. It's sad that he went off track. Because he tried to be a teacher when he was only a prophet. Then you had the west wind blowing in after some time. You see, people began to get hold of an understanding about their position in the Lord. People began to take authority over demons. People began to know that the devil is nothing. And you began to see that west wind, the move, Charismatic move is always characterized by charismatic songs. A lot of people came into the charismatic move because of the worship. They know something is there. And that west wind was blowing all the time. Then we have the south wind. You begin to see the faith movement. Almost every tondic and hairy man of God. And Tom, Dick, and not so heavy. <laughs> Saying, you know, prosperity and restoration to God. Restoration of church structure. Restoration of truth. Restoration of prosperity. Restoration of this. Restoration of that. My friend, we had a south wind blowing for quite a long time. But there's one more wind coming. The north wind. And that wind is going to bring forth a new breed of men of God that flow into that north wind. 
Now these other winds are still blowing and they need to blow. But in each age and generation and decade, God demonstrates a strength in each wind. And the north wind that God is going to blow forth is men and women of God who will bring forth a presence of God. Now, there are two prophets that I bring before you. And the third is also Elijah at his last stage. But he was more the east wind. Samuel and Moses. I want you to see the kind of person Samuel was. In the book of First Samuel, we begin to see the north wind. See, every time when you have a north wind prophet come to the scene, it means that there is a transition period that is totally different. It's not just a, a flow, a different wave. It's a complete transition. When Elijah came and Elijah went, there was still, different, there was still a king's period, northern kingdom and southern kingdom. He only confronted Ahab and Jezebel and the false prophets of Baal. When the West Wind prophet shows up, they always bring forth that new, fresh songs of deliverance. When the South Wind prophet shows up, there's a restoration. But when the North Wind prophet shows up, you know that there's going to be a change, a closing of one chapter and an opening of a new chapter. When Moses came to the scene, it was time for a new chapter. And when Moses died, the Israelites have to talk to God in a different way. Through the tabernacle. And that tabernacle was preserved in different outer form in Solomon's temple. It was still basically the same pattern. But it was now made from gold and silver. Instead of animal's hair. But the same ark was used. Telling you it's still the same. But when Samuel came to the scene, it tells you that there was a difference. That the nation of Israel was totally changed. And now God will speak and deliver them through a new face of a kingship. From a theocracy, they became a monarchy. When an when a Israel prophet shows up, you know there is just preparation. But when a north wind shows up, in our days, he's coming through night. The chapter of the Gentile age is going to close. In First Samuel, you notice something that Samuel had a demonstration of that. The other prophet did not demonstrate. In 1 Samuel chapter 7, when he took his full position and authority in Israel, in 1 Samuel chapter 7, and when the Israelites were going to war, because he was not, in a sense, a different type of flavor of prophet from the rest, in 1 Samuel chapter 7, look at how he does battle. In verse Seven. When the Philistines heard that the children of Israel had gathered together at Mizpah, the lords of the Philistines went up against Israel. And when the children of Israel heard of it, they were afraid of the Philistines. And it tells you here that in chapter 7, verse 10, Samuel was offering up the burnt offering. And as he was doing that, the Philistines drew near to battle against Israel. But the Lord thundered. There is a north wind prophet. He fights with thunder and lightning from the presence of God. They didn't even need to wield a sword. He just gave God an offering and the presence of God was enough to rout the enemy. Now he was a he was a prophet of thunder. If Elijah was a prophet of fire, 
Samuel was a prophet of thunder. Then you get all kinds of prophet. You got fire, you got thunder and lightning. And he literally scared the weeds out of the people when he proclaimed the Lord's displeasure. In First Samuel chapter 12, in verse 20, when he told the people, You have done all these things wickedly, he told them. In First Samuel chapter 12, verse 20, he says, Do not fear, you have done all these things wickedly. In verse 18, you know this is what he did. The Samuel called to the Lord, and the Lord sent thunder and rain. People have never seen that before. To witness to what Samuel was saying. Now Moses was another one who brought God's presence. And you read about how the skin of his face shone with the presence of God. That's the North Wind. They bring about a special awesome presence. Of God into the life of the people of God. In other words, they bring you right to the portals of heaven. When we look at all these four, four flavors of prophets, we were close with this. How do we reach into the levels of these four wings? Each one of these gave you a clue. The east wind and the west wind go together. The south wind and the north wind goes together. The words of Elijah are important here. Let's look at Elijah in the book of First Kings. At a statement that he always made, starting with chapter 17. Notice his favorite saying in verse 1. How he introduces himself, because that tells you what his life is about. As the Lord God of Israel lives, before whom I stand. That's his favorite thing. As the Lord lives, before whom I stand. Now he was in a spiritual and almost a physical sense, always standing in the presence of God. That's how he moved into the east wind powerfully. In the book of First Kings 19, First Kings 19. Now, as I said, he was an east wind prophet. Because you see here, there was a wind in verse 11, but the wind that he brought forth and he saw was destructive. It destroyed everything in the way. And then the prophecy he was given by God through the still small voice is all destructive. Look at verse uh, 17. It shall be, there are three people he is going to anoint. And all three of them are going to destroy. In verse 17. It shall be that whoever escapes the sword of Hazel, Jehu will kill. Whoever escapes the sword of Jehu, Elisha will kill. Tell you, East Wind prophets, don't play with them. And look at chapter 18. His favorite saying coming out again. Verse 15. As the Lord of hosts lives, before whom I stand. Now the key word tells you how to enter into counsel and mind. If you ever under, enter into counsel and mind, you must spend a lot of time in worship. And the west wind music comes along, helpful. Elisha knew how to tap into power. When he needed to prophesy, he said, Bring me a musician. Second Kings chapter three. So, the east wind and the west wind, you tap into that through worship. Worship with the aid of songs. 
นี้ you spend time worshiping God and I will challenge you we talk about 24 hour praise and worship you haven't seen what 24 hour praise and worship will do we talk about 24 hour prayer and fasting have there been any time when people had 24 hour praise and worship did you know that david was a west wind prophet and he instituted praise and worship 24 hours and that was what brought about revival in his day and it lasted until solomon's time and that's in my heart once we begin to finish our project that we are having we could organize some things and we have certain enough main power you see in my heart that we want to institute not only 24 hour pray not only 24 hour counseling but we have to institute 24 hour worship hallelujah think about what it will do 24 hour worship to god just to god and if we will do that and move into the depths of worship you will see counsel and might demonstrate like it never demonstrate before when people move into depths of worship that's when they tap into the east wind and the west wind how do i tap into the other two the rain and the thunder south wind and the north wind you notice it that those prophets who function in the area where elisha always say i stand in god's presence david always minister to the lord in song the other two flavors of prophet always you see them doing this they are always fasting they are always praying can you see the key yama the key ma daniel was always fasting every time you read about him he is fasting moses was always fasting 40 day here 40 day here 40 day there always thinking God, always praying Samuel says when he retired and turned over the leadership to Saul he says you know pray that I will not sin by by not praying for you I'll continue to pray for you he's a person of prayer and you tap into the south wind and north wind and remember what the word of God says about the rain which includes a thunder and a lightning is this where there's a prophecy of rain coming down in the book of Joel the letter rain is preceded by a call to fast it's so clear cut you cannot miss it it's preceded by a call to fast you read Joel carefully sound a trumpet call a fast sanctify a fast then only it talk about and it shall come to pass in the last day when you talk about asking the lord for the rain it includes fasting and praying and let me share from my heart up to you which is what i shared when we had just had a graduation of our bible school students i shared with them that in 15 years of ministry and in ministering to other ministers who struggle here and encouraging them this one thing i know it is not possible to rot the work of god in any city or any place without fasting today if you want to succeed in the ministry god call it will require fasting if you want the former rain and the latter rain it will require fasting every missionary move in the book of acts was born of fasting paul's three missionary journeys began in acts 13 they were fasting and ministering to the lord you know what they tap on both wind did jesus have all the four wind yes you read the gospel of luke chapter 4 verse 18 and 19 he says the spirit of the lord is upon me that's the north wind And he says that he has come to set the captives free, deliverance, the west wind. 
to heal the broken hearted. Bring sight to the blind. Healing. The East Wind. To preach the acceptable year of the Lord. The South Wind. Restoration. And Jesus himself says, when they talk about fasting, the days will come when the bridegroom is taken from them, which he is now, until we are restored back to him. Then they will fast. And it's not possible, my friend, to see the outpouring and the latter rain without fasting. You would have to take fasting and pray to get the south wind and the north wind blowing into the churches today. Let's pray. Father God, as we stand in your presence, we recognize, Lord, what an awesome God you are. We recognize, O oh God, that in these days you are restoring truth, you are restoring to the body of Christ. Because the south wind is blowing. We know it's only preparation for the north wind to blow. And we ask, O oh God, that you bring us to the point where we would be able, O oh God, to meet you and to see you face to face. Let the four winds blow in our churches, Lord. Let the prophetic flavors be restored, O oh God. We ask, O oh God, that you do a new thing. That you raise up a people who will be so full of God that they will turn the world right side up. That people will see God in them. That the glory of God will be strong. We know that when the seven thunders come, the mystery of God shall be finished. And we know that preceding the seven thunders is a north wind, Lord. They will blow. So we are so God in this age that we live. The generation that we live, Lord, you restore once again. And you cause a people of worship to rise. And a people who so hunger and thirst and fast to seek your faith. We ask that your mercy be extended and your grace imparted in our lives, O God. We thank you for your mercy. We worship you, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's rise and sing that song. We are standing on holy ground. We are standing on holy ground. We are standing on holy ground. pastors here in this meeting to come up with me on the platform right now. I know that there are many here who need various areas of ministry. And tonight we have focused more on teaching than on moving in the spirit. I'm sure you will understand that we could do both. We could move in the spirit but it would take several hours then we would not be able to teach. And you're going to teach, 
then we have less time. And sometimes we got to make a choice between the two. And we have chosen to focus on teaching. And now we do some ministry, even though that, even though we have a limited time. But whatever God wants to impart into your life, to prepare you, He will do so tonight. Because teaching is so important, it gives you tools to go back with. While moving in the spirit, you will just sit or stand in the awesomeness of His move. But you're left without the tools. You're only left with the awe of God in your heart. Those are important too because they inspire hunger in us for more things. But we want to be balanced. There's still a lot more to go. We've given you tools. And you will taste the move of God wherever you are in your churches. And these pastors will come here even by just sitting in the presence. An anointing has come upon each one of your lives. And that anointing will cause a depth of the Spirit to move into your ministry like never before. And right here in our midst tonight, are those of you who, some of you, you may have the gift of prophecy, some the ministry of prophecy, some the call to the office of a prophet. And it doesn't mean that you're moving to it yet. It may take some years for some of you. But this is a prophetic conference. And the Bible tells us that Paul says that through his ministry, laying on a hand, and the hands of the presbytery, the gift was imparted in the Timothy's life. Next, we have taught on the prophetic gifts and the flow of prophetic prophecy. Tonight, if you are in our midst here and you know whatever category, flavor or area, whether it be the first level, second level, third level, give a prophecy, ministry of prophecy or an office of prophecy. But you know that that's the area that God is strengthening you to flow in. We are going to minister to you tonight. And as we sing that song again, we'd like you to come right up and then you stand where the space and together with these ministers, we're going to pray with you. Would you please put out your hands? It's the same anointing that this day for we seal into these lives. That 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 we seal into these lives tonight. The spirit of prophecy to usher in what God is bringing of the north wind tonight. We are standing. Come right quickly right now. In each one of you ministers here as your minister, God will quicken to your life perhaps different ways of ministering, then you will flow with it. Flow with what God shows you. Whether we're laying on our hands, lifting up your hands, whatever, it's a creativity that will flow in your life. From this day forth, ministers of God, whomever you lay hands on, are going to feel that presence of God come upon them. And they're going to come words of knowledge and words of wisdom in your life. And there's going to come an anointing. And when you lay hands on them, people are just suddenly going to fall under the power. Some of them even before you touch them. And some of them even when you lift up your hands in front of them, they're just going to drop under that power. Because they see you and anointing into your life. And they will always be with your life. Right now. Thank you, Lord. Now, Go forth and minister to this right now. Ashes just have them lying all over this place. All over this place. We are standing. Be very careful because there's a strong anointing. Even before you touch them, they can just fall all over the place. It's just this anointing. 
all over his place. There's a prophetic anointing flowing upon. Be very careful. Catch this, you've got to be very quick tonight, please. You've got to be very quick. Because it's very strong upon these pastors. It has already been imparted upon these pastors. And it will be constantly upon your lives in your own churches. We are standing on holy ground And I know If there's no space, then just find space, maybe here or wherever All around Just flowing. Some of you are receiving mantles, mantles of the office of a prophet, some the office of other areas. We are prophetic plan. Remember, whatever area God called you to, even as Saul was called to be a king, yet it was a prophet who ministered to him. In the same way, different flows can impart different gifts. Just receive whatever God has in your life. We are standing on holy ground And I know that there are angels all around is just blowing in this place. Some of you are just going to fall even before somebody comes to you. Because there's a breeze that's blowing right now. There's a wind of God that's just blowing across this place. Even as you come right up, right where you are, God's Spirit is ministering right to you. Even standing there, the wind of God is blowing across you right now. It's the wind of God blowing in this place right now. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. 